Malik's first job, Financial Principles for Teens, is an excellent resource to get your children started on understanding the basics of financial literacy. This book, which is set in Brownville, Brooklyn, about a young man who gets his first job and then shortly thereafter sits down with his dad to learn how to manage his money. There are several topics that are covered within this work, uh, such as paying yourself first, disciplining your spending, knowing the difference between an asset and a liability, creating multiple sources of income, as well as the importance of being charitable. So again, if you want to get your children started on understanding finance and becoming responsible adults, we highly recommend that you purchase the book, Malik's First Job, Financial Principles for Teens. So please visit maliksfirstjob.com to get more information. Peace. When, when, when growing up in Newark, the whole idea was to make it out. We wanted to make it out. You know, it's not till I got older that I realized it's not about making it out, but it's about coming back, going somewhere, acquiring the knowledge, coming back and making the place that you grew better. Right. Malik's first job podcast here to answer any questions that y'all ask. Financial literacy and resources, parents and young people becoming bosses, CEOs, future leaders, entrepreneurs, conferences and boardrooms getting sponsors secured. If you want generational wealth, Brooklyn's own Kerwin Phillip with information to help. Malik's first job podcast. Malik, Malik podcast. Brooklyn's own Kerwin Phillip. Kerwin, Kerwin Phillip. Malik's first job podcast, podcast, pod, podcast, Brooklyn's own, Kerwin Phillip. Generation of wealth, 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 wealth. All right, peace, peace, peace. What's going on? This is Kerwin Phillip, again with another episode of the Malik's first job podcast, where we discuss leadership, entrepreneurship, and financial literacy for parents and teens. Today, we have an icon on the show today. When I was in college, I was introduced to this brother as a member of the, the iconic hip hop group, the Lords of the Underground. Um, but he's also, you know, now recently he's running for the West Ward Congressman position in Newark, New Jersey. He's also the founder Councilman. of the- Councilman, Councilman. Well, what did I say? Congress. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's I, all um, good, it's all good. Right, the, the West Ward, West Ward, councilman position in Newark, New Jersey. He's also an indigenous resident of Newark, New Jersey as well. That's very important, right? Um, a graduate of Shaw University with a degree in mass communications, as well as um, the founder of the 211 Community Impact Nonprofit Organization. All this is to introduce this man, do it all, do pray, Kelly, how you doing, brother? Bye, 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 bye. <laughs> hey, man, I'm good, man. I'm good. Thank you, man, for having me on the show. I know it's a lot going on behind me, but um, you know, it's it's eight days away from the election, so right. you know, seven days after tomorrow, it's a week away. So we work. Right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So let's take it back to the beginning, right? Again, I was introduced to you as part of the hip hop group. Laws of the Underground, right? Now, how did you get involved in music? Um, the way I got involved in music was my uncle came home from the army, my mother's brother. He had nowhere to stay for a little while, so she let him stay in the extra room. And, um, and while he stayed in the extra room, he used to play this record all the time, you know, that I, I later learned to be Rapper's Delight by the Sugar Hill Gang. So... Mm -hmm. He played the record. It was different than what my mother was playing in the living room. And uh, I just fell in love with it. He asked me not to go in his room, touch his record. And I went in there and broke in every time and touched the record. That's when wow. 12 Inches was really 12 inch records, you right. know. And I played it over and over again. And, and I wanted to find out what else sound like this. You know, where did it come from? And then more studying, I found out that it was bigger than that record. It was a whole entire culture. It was dance, it was art, it was fashion. You know, it was narration of a culture. So I just fell in love with it, man. And that's when I fell in love with hip hop. Wow, wow, wow. How was, as a matter of fact, because Hank was from Newark, right? 
Who? Big Bang, Big Bang Hank. Yeah, Big Bad. Yeah, Big Bad Hank. Bank. <laughs> yeah. Big Hank was from from Jersey, man. They were from Ed, um Inglewood. Inglewood. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I knew it was from Jersey, but I guess I got the, the spot mixed up. So I guess then, how did that progress to you? I guess forming the group itself. Well, it progressed to me getting in. You know. In hip hop, you gotta go through stages, but not just hip hop. In life, man, you go through yeah. stages, you go through tests, you go through so many different things. And I did that. I, I went through so many different groups. I started, you know, trying to be a graffiti artist, but my penmanship wasn't that nice. You know, then I started to uh try to be a dancer, but I can only really pop. I wasn't really a great break dancer. You okay. know, I started to DJ, but I really was just scratching the records up. But I noticed when I when I tried to move a crowd, when I would okay. MC you know, that I had something there, you know, right. and I and I can galvanize the people. And I said, whoa, okay, let me hone in on this. And that's what I did. You know, I got with, with crews called the Undercover Rockers. You know, we got sweatshirt okay. and iron the letters <laughs> on, you know, and they turned yeah. colors in the wash. <laughs> right, you know, right. And I got with the true MCs. And, and each group started, I didn't know what was preparing me to be in Laws of the Underground, you know, okay. but it, but more so than just being in a group, it prepared me as an MC. It prepared me in the culture of hip hop. Wow, wow, wow. So so did you form the group in Jersey or, you know, was it someplace else as far as Laws of the Underground? Laws of the Underground got formed while we were in college at Shaw University. Okay. Um, okay. DJ Lord Jazz actually is the creator of Laws of the Underground group. While he was in college, he was the best DJ. You know, you always have your, your DJ who does all of the school parties, all of the events. Right. Lord Jazz was that. His best friend was Derek L.A. Jackson, who was from L.A., hence the why we called him L.A. Uh, right. But L.A. was Marley Mall's cousin, and he was about okay. to graduate that year. So he said when he graduates that he was going to work for his cousin. His cousin Marley okay. Mall was the biggest DJ oh, yeah. at that time in the country, probably the world. And, right. uh, you know, he, he was going to work for him to be an A&R for him. And he okay. told Lord Jazz, put together two MCs, you DJ for him, and I'll play it for my cousin Marley Marl. And that wow. just happened to be Do It All Funky Man. And now who's known as DJ Lord Jazz, man. And now we're Lords of the Underground. Wow, that's big. That was a big look right there. That was a big look. Yes. Yeah, so I know that, you know, with the group, you know, you, you all had like massive success, you know, traveled the world, you know, had a lot of great records. And I know that from there, you had transitions like acting and music production and things of that sort. So, you know, from going from entertainment, how did you transition into like community work? Well, that's just it, man. You know, I had a, a brother by the name of Hafiz Farid, a Muslim brother who was okay. uh, chief of staff for a, a political councilman here by the name of Ralph T. Grant Sr. at the time in Newark, New Jersey. So he was always like a mentor to me. He was always, uh, he became Lords of the Underground's manager. So he had me in a community before I was ever even in Lords of the Underground. You know, so I was doing community work and, and it's documented. You know, I was doing community work while I was in high school. We were, okay. we were doing uh, Teens Networking Today for Tomorrow. We were, we were uh, in advanced uh, vocational and technical programs of, of helping teen pregnancy and helping teens on drugs. and. So I was doing all of those things before I was even in Lords of the Underground. So I didn't know that it was preparing me for everything that is, you know, has come to fruition today. Wow, wow, wow. So, so, so I guess the work that you're doing now is nothing new. It's already no, been embedded it's in the since you were in school, uh, since you were in high school. Yeah, it's, it's been, it's been, I've been doing it since I've been in high school, yes. Wow. Wow, wow. So then what led to you forming like the 211 Community Impact uh, Organization? Uh, I just didn't want to be a complainer. You know, uh, I sat down with two partners at the time who helped me form it. And we just talked about community. We talked about how do we make an impact, you know, right. and, and there you have it right there, community impact. How do we make an impact on community? What resources and relationships do we have individually and collectively to bring to the table to, to make some great things happen in our city to be gap fillers, right? Okay. Uh, you know, because we're not necessarily against the administ administration, but anything that we felt like they couldn't cover or they did not yet cover, 
We wanted to be those gap fillers. We wanted to help our people and meet them where they are. And, and hence started 211 Community Impact that started with uh, education and literacy. Okay, okay. So well, what kind of initiatives did you all launch under that, uh, that nonprofit? Like, you know, what did you all do like, like within the community of, Rich, um, of Newark? So we brought literacy programs to the block. We would do okay. a, a book on the block, read on the block. So we would shut down the block and we would put uh literacy events through reading we would bring you know sometimes it you you would talk the the children actually have a higher grade reading level than the parent so what we would do is we would set up games on the block shut it down people would be like well, what's going on it's a block party uh if you want to call it that but really it's a literacy event but we couldn't tell them it's just a literacy event we'll act like it's a block party and then we we would set up events where we have the uh do things like hold up a newspaper, you know, and then we'll ask the child, what is your mom, mother doing? What is your father doing? Oh, they're reading the paper. But they didn't realize that their mother or their father couldn't read or they didn't read past the third grade level. But just that right there, that was for the parent. If you just do things, you don't have to be, even if you can't read, just by you holding the paper influences and inspires your child to read. You know, so we would do literacy things like that. We've given uh, 25,000 books, textbooks to the Newark public school system. Um, we've done uh, programs where we bring in people to inspire, like KRS One, to inspire not just the youth, but the adults. And we just, we, and also not just the, the regular um, traditional literacy. We would make right. people literate of, the, their rights, the ordinances within the city, that you have the right to go to your school and talk to the teachers, the principals, the educators about your children. And you know, you have the right to say this, you have the right to go and voice your concerns and your opinions at the council meetings in your city about whether you believe this is not happening or that is not happening. You have that right. So we wanted to make people literate about their, uh, their rights within the city. Wow, wow. You know, you know, I was thinking earlier today, you know, the fact that, like, you know, you know, our generation, you know, we grew up, you know, people called us like, you know, the, the hip hop generation and that now a lot of us like in our 40s and our 50s. And I think like a lot of my peers, you know, I have friends that back in the 90s, they were backpackers, but now they're doctors, they're lawyers, you know, they're accountants and stuff like that. They're in these professional positions. And I look at you. And see that you extend this into like politics. Now, how is imp how important is it for us to get involved in these type of arenas? You know, you know, is how important is it for us to do that? It's super important. You know why? Uh, a lot of people, when the presidential elections happen in the United States, people run out and they make sure they vote for the president because they don't want any wars or they don't, you know, they don't want the, the they want to pick the right guy who's not just going to push the bomb, the button right. for the bomb. You know, and that's cool. That's important. But uh, what I've learned is that local hip, uh, local politics are way more important okay. because I believe that all politics are local, right? The, the local politics actually, for me, trickle up because it takes such a long time for the, the presidential politics to trickle down and affect the person in your community directly. But when you vote locally, when you vote in the municipal elections, in the local elections, your school board election, you have children, you know somebody that has children, you know, or a niece or a nephew or what have you, or your neighbor has children or there's children that live on your block. Those school board elections are super important. You know, in Newark, New Jersey, we have a $1 billion budget for the school board and only less than 4% came out to vote. And you're talking about a city of 311,000 residents, you know? So you have to understand that if you want to be included in the process and be part of the solution instead of being part of the, the problem, then you need to be involved in local elections because local elections affect you and your family directly. I'll give you an example. Even if you don't vote, you hear people say, I don't vote, I don't even get involved in that type of stuff. Yes, but locally, whether you vote or not, you will still be affected by an ordinance or a legislation that's made locally. Let's take it. Let's take it for a small idea. If 
if there's a, a ordinance for um, alternate side of the street parking and you don't vote and you park on that side of the street that you don't suppose supposed to park on, right. you still get a ticket. True. But if you voted to, to say that we're not doing alternate side of the street parking on this stuff, then maybe you won't get a ticket. So my point is you have an opportunity to be involved in politics that affect you directly. Right. Right. So, I mean, how do we get that message across? Because oftentimes you see, you see people are pretty apathetic about going out to vote, but yet they still complain. How, how do we mobilize people to get out and, you know, be active in their local politics? I think you mobilize them by by um, including them in the processes, by letting them know that of things that, uh, like I just said, show them the proof to concept, you know, show them that, you know, uh, because only such and such percent came out for the school board. Now, the the school hours are longer or mm -hmm. or, you know, uh, or this curriculum was bought for the school system. People don't realize that, you know, they bid. There's a bid for for curriculums to be taught in the uh, in your city. So maybe you got the lesser one. I went to a bid one time for the school, and I was amazed. It was my first ever, and I seen a you know a group of people sit in a circle, and in that circle, I seen one that had four hundred and twenty five dollars per child. Another one was two eighty five per child. One was one ninety five per child. Another one was three fifty per child. So which one do you get? You know, how do you decide on which curriculum? If if Newark has 40,000 students, you know, do we get the 425? Is it just, is it is it better because it's more expensive or is it just expensive? Is the right. is the 285 better and, and a good price? Or do you say we can't afford the top notch one so we'll meet in the middle? It's so many things that, that come into the equation on, on a decision making. So if you're... Uh, if you vote for the school board election, then maybe you'll have a voice in that. Maybe you'll have a say in those type of things and vice versa with municipal elections as well. You know, right. if you, you can't complain about what the mayor is doing or what the council is voting on, I mean, you can, but it right. falls on deaf ear if you don't have uh, any skin in the game. You know, right. it's not about complaining. It's about being on the solution, uh, the solution based side. And the people who vote, they should be on the solution side. You know, because they have a right to, to to hold people to the fire, to hold people accountable because they're casting their vote for the people that they believe in. True. Exactly. Exactly. So what do you feel are like, like maybe like the two or three biggest um, issues that Newark is facing right now? Well, I think one of the struggles is, you know, how do we grow a city without gentrifying it? OK. You know, that's a struggle. You know, that, that's that's one struggle because and I think the mayor is doing an incredible job doing that. You know, you you have uh, you have a city that you want to grow and then you have uh, you have to fight, fight with people on that side by, by empowering and economically empowering and economic development. But then you have to uh, fight with the residents who have been here during this downtime is has been here through its turmoil. How do we not push them out? You know? When, because anytime development happens, prices rise, right? So right. that's a struggle right there. I think that's one of the biggest struggles that, that our mayor has. And I think that he's doing a, a great job with that. Um, right. another, another struggle is, is we can't move fast enough for the residents. <laughs> <laughs> you know, everybody wants it microwave. Everybody right. wants it right now. You know, right. uh, Somebody just threw something down on the ground. Where's the street cleaner? You know, everybody <laughs> wants it immediately. As my grandma would say, immediately. You right. know, <laughs> and it just can't happen. It can't happen. You can't look at anybody who's sitting in a political seat and expect for them to be Superman or Superwoman. You have to right. be, you have to be part of the 18. You have to be right. part of the squad. You have to be included in the process. Of, of making things happen and moving forward in a positive direction. If we don't use the residents, if we don't use the business owners, if we don't use the educators, if we don't use the people of the city to help the politicians, then right. it's not gonna happen as fast as they want it to happen. You know? Right. And then the, then the third problem is um, 
the the third uh i guess struggle not really problems but the, right. the struggle is making people notice the opportunities that already exist you know okay. it's, it's like people want why we don't have this or why we don't have that but you're not even utilizing the things that we already have Right. You know, utilize these things first so we can grow and, and grow to that level. And we can warrant when you asking for federal dollars to support you when you need something for this. You can say, well, we had a million people. We had a hundred thousand thousand people. We had two hundred thousand people utilize this. But if we can't even say that, then why would they give us more when we're not even using what we have? So those are the three concerns that I, I see. Wow. So um, kind of touching back on the whole, you know, because I, I, I used to do a workshop, right, on like the power of um, the youth in hip hop. And I also, you know, it was a workshop I did back in, you know, about six, seven years ago. And I was speaking about like the, the early days of the genre, like with Herc and Flash and everybody. Like this was pretty much created or started by young people. Right, but because at the time they, they, they were all teenagers, and this multi-billion-dollar industry was started by teenagers. And you look at different movements throughout history; it was always launched by young people, like below the age of twenty-one. So, how can we get our young people? You know, people talk about how hip hop is right now, and even beyond that, how can we get our young people, you know, engaged into doing, you know? a lot of more constructive things and being more active in the community. I think that we, we sit down first and have conversations with them, right? You know, right. get them all in the same room, get them all in the, you know, on the same accord. And, and then we can't really, we have to utilize their interests. We have to put their interests to test. You know, right. utilize what they want to do. We can no longer throw up a basketball court in, in a baseball right. field. And just expect them to come. It's no right. longer if you build it, they're gonna come. No, they're right. building other things, so they're going to those things. You know, right. so we have to have conversations. What interests you? What you think should be on this corner? What you think should be in this neighborhood? And, and right. believe me, when you alienate them, they're making up the underground anyway. They're living right. what they want to do in the underground anyway. So right. show the interest, even if you don't understand it. I'll give you an example. My mother hated hip hop. Yeah. All our parents did. Hey, um, all right? when, at the time that, that I was coming up. Mm -hmm. but what she did do is a friend, I'll give you the fast story of it. A friend of mine got killed. I hung with him every day. She was coming home on the bus. She saw all of the commotion, saw people that I hang, hung with every day at the scene. Mm -hmm. She jumped off of the bus. She saw these people looking for her son, of course, with 13 years old at this time. She doesn't mm -hmm. find me. She runs home. And the only reason why I wasn't there because I told my friend, my best friend at 13, that I was going in the house to write raps in my notebook. It's the only reason why I wasn't with him. So I go into the house. I write raps in my notebook. My mom comes in. I have the headphones on. She startles me. And she says, basically, fast forward and again, what kept you in this house? Mm -hmm. You know, we both crying because something happened to my friend. I said, well, I was writing raps in my notebook. She said, what do we have to do to take this to the next level? Now, she hates this. Right. All right. What do we have to do to take this to the next level? I think our rent at that time was maybe $600. I told her to take $450 at that time. It was still Real to Reels and Big Time Studios. $450 mm -hmm. to get me two songs done. And I got to do it in two hours or, or three hours, <laughs> something like that. Right. You know. So she went to her sock drawer, the rent drawer. And she got $450 out of our $600 rent and put me in a studio. That's unconditional love. That's yes. the type of love that we don't find in our community too often. But that's the love that we have to have. We have to have the type of love that even when we don't love something, we still support it because we love the person that is in love with it. Wow. You understand what I'm saying? And when we can find that type of love, man, we'll be unstoppable, man. You know? Yes, yes, yes. So, and I know, like I said, I know you, you're a busy man. You got a lot going on. You probably had a long day today. So, a couple last questions. So, everybody's not in, in Newark, New Jersey, right? How can those that are outside the area support you in, in your efforts? 
man, we always, you know, we need phone bankers. We need people with boots on the ground. But it's only a week left. So right now, if, if you can make a dollar contribution, you can make $20. If you can make $2,600, which is the limit, you know, per person. I just ask you to text Kelly. Text K-E-L-L-Y to 973-846-2200. One one. Once again, text Kelly, K E L L Y, to nine seven three eight four six two two one one. And you know, just follow instructions from there. You know, you can text a dollar or you can text up to twenty six hundred dollars, man. That's it right there. I appreciate yeah. you for putting that on the screen. You know, yes, sir. text Kelly, yes, sir. man. You can go, and you know, I'm the only, I'm the only candidate in the West Ward of Newark, New Jersey, that that created a revitalization plan for the community. So you can also go to DupreKelly.com, D-U-P-R-E-K-E-L-L-Y.com, and you can check out the revitalization plan. You know, and uh, we got a lot of work that we're doing here, man. And 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 also, if you know anybody in North New Jersey, whether it's the East Ward, whether it's the North Ward, South Ward, Central Ward, you know, West Ward, tell them it's all Team Baraka. You know, uh, our mayor and administration have, have been doing a great job, and we all lose if 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 one of us lose. So right. tell them if they know somebody in North New Jersey to vote Team Baraka all the way around and see four in the West Ward. Do pray Kelly. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So I got to say again, I commend you for the work that you're doing. Far too often, a lot of our you know, people within the community, they become successful and they leave. You know, right. but you chose to come back, right? Mm -hmm. And come back and make an impact, right? Come back and, you know, look to speak to be a leader to implement change in the community. And you have to be, I have to tip my hat off to you for doing that, you know. Thank so, you, man. I salute but, you. I'm gonna be honest. When, 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 growing up in Newark, the whole idea was to make it out. We wanted to make it out. You know, it's not till I got older that I realized it's not about making it out, but it's about coming back, going somewhere, acquiring the knowledge, coming back, and making the place that you grew better. Right. Exactly. Exactly. All right. So again, thank you. Coming on the podcast this Thanks, evening, brother. I you appreciate know. it. All right, so we can crab legs and go to sleep. What say it again? I said, now how about to eat some crab legs and try to go to sleep? But that probably won't. <laughs> all right, man. Hey, I wish you all the best, man. We're gonna be pushing for you. Thank you, man. Tell a friend to tell a friend, man. Team Baraka, do pray Kelly in that West War C4, man, so we can foresee what we need to do in, in uh in this community, man. I appreciate it. Yes, Yes, sir. All right, man. Salute. You yeah, have a good one. Thank you. Right. Generation wealth, 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 wealth.